Zoom, the team from Spirits Podcast. Hi, everybody. Hello. We're so Hello. excited to have you with us. Um, we are Spirits. We are a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week, we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. I'm Julia. And I'm Eric. You're not and used to doing that with us. Huh? I know. No, normally, it's just me and Julia. Not on the intros. <laughs> now we have the whole team together. And if you're not familiar with spirits, just imagine if you could sip a cocktail and like walk around a museum or an archive or a library responsibly with tops on your drinks and just hang out with your best friends and talk about the stuff that you're learning. That's what spirits is. So Julia is our expert here. Eric and I are along for the ride to learn and make some jokes along the way. So we hope that you enjoy the show. Enthusiast, I would say. Not expert, but I'm here to Enthusiast. teach you a little bit about mythological dogs today. Very exciting. We're, Very inspi exciting. we're aspiring experts. I would yes, say of course. Let's get our slideshow up. All right, gang. Hello, mm -hmm. hello. Welcome to Spirits. And for today, let's expand that first. And for today, we're going to be talking about who's a good boy. A tour <laughs> of mythological dogs from Spirits. Very good. This is a very good encapsulation of what Spirits is for anyone who doesn't know. <laughs> Thank you. So first off, pups, there's a lot of them. Mythological dogs come in many shapes and forms. Some of them resemble the dogs that we know and love. Others have human forms. Some of them are even human canine hybrids, which I know, Amanda, you love so much. Amanda's Running gag. Don't love it. Fan. Don't love it. Don't love that like Rubik's cube of different animal parts. We got a griffin, lion, snake, lizard, dragon hybrid. I'm just, I'm scared of it. <laughs> but each of these dogs represents something that we love about our four-legged friends and what about them piques our interest. So it also reminds us why dogs have been humanity's companions for a millennium. So as we go through this tour of mythological dogs, I would love if we could play a little mini game, if you guys will indulge me. Okay, so cool. okay. I did not sure. know we'd be playing a game, but I'm, I'm I have, ready. I have my salty dog here with me with blood uh -huh. orange juice, and I hope everybody at home uh, who can or wants to has a drink as well. I went with my salty dog, but we didn't have grapefruit juice, so I went with lime juice instead, which is basically just, you know, a gin and tonic, but that's okay. There's a salt room. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So for our mini game, um, don't get too competitive. It's not going to be a super stressful one. But for each uh, dog, I'm going to be providing a uh, couple of pictures and or not pictures, Eric, not always pictures, but uh, some of them are images. Illustrations. And I would love, <laughs> illustrations. And I would love if you guys can imagine that you're in your local dog park uh, and this pup has bounded up to you after playing with the rest of the dogs. And I want to picture you guys hearing the name from the owner calling out to that dog to be like, hey, leave them alone. And just tell me from your heart of hearts, what is that pup's name? You think you can okay. get that? Okay. All right, yeah. All right. Awesome. So we're going to get started with our first pup. And this, my friends, is Sarama or Dev Shuni. And this is from Hinduism's cosmology. Uh, their name means Fleet One or the Runner. Now, what would you guys name said pup? Marshmallow. Okay. Going with Marshmallow? I'm going with... Uh... Jack. Okay, I'm into it. Very I've always gone with human names. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It being <laughs> it being Indian, but you know, I'm going. I'm going with Jack. I'm it makes sense it. that you do have two dogs named Herbert and Henry, yes. grandfather's names. Yes. They are. They're old man names, and I love them so much. One of them was in the room before before we got started, and he decided to leave. Poor Henry. We love him though. So uh, Surama means fleet one or the runner. Uh, that name kind of indicates that she was at times a messenger for the gods, similar to Hermes in Greek mythology. Uh, her official title is Dev Shuni or God of the Dogs. Her most well-known story is when a group of robbers stole the god of the heavens and storms Indra's cattle herd. And in an attempt to get his cows back, Indra first sent a bird to deal with the robbers, but the robbers were able to bribe the bird with dahi, which is like a yogurt or a curd. Uh, the bird f goes back to Indra, flies back to Indra, and tells him that the robbers didn't have the cows. But Indra finds out that the bird is lying because it spits up some of the curd and it shows his betrayal. Not great. But we're okay. not talking about birds this episode. But Julia, I'm so curious, how would you feed a bird yogurt? <laughs> What, what would you do? A little bowl, I think. Just a little bowl. A little sure. bowl. You put some Drink honey on that yogurt. That's definitely going to get that bird Do they over. peck at it or do they like take it away? 
I don't know, like how do birds drink water? Probably like do that. birds have tongues? I feel like <laughs> it could, birds do have tongues. It could like <laughs> slip slurp up some yogurt. All right. Maybe birds maybe we need to invent gogurt for birds. Gogurt for birds. Biodegradable. Yeah. I love that. For okay. your cosmopolitan bird on the go. <laughs> mm -hmm. Start pitching shark tank. Right or your skateboarding bird. Who just That's needs, true. Just needs the protein while he does some kickflips. He has his bird. Yeah, he has his snapback. All he needs is his gogurt. But we're not talking about birds. So Indra finds out that, uh, so Indra next sends Surima. So like a true diplomat, Surima manages to convince the robbers that uh, they need to return the cows. And they make a deal with Indra for returning the cows that she and all of her future children will have all of the milk in Indra's flock whenever they so desire. It's a good deal. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, it was said uh, that later some of her children would end up serving the god of death, Yama, uh, and they were described as brindled hounds with four eyes each who would guard the path to the afterlife. Sounds cute. I'm a big fan. It's a, it's a very cute. Like, I imagine that it's probably supposed to be intimidating. They are guarding the afterlife. They work for the god of death, but it's too cute. I, the double eyes is adorable, in my opinion. That, I don't know. That, I, would, I would be concerned. Okay. I think that would scare me away. It's Good. double the soulful eyes to stare into and just like yes. love your pup. Here's the thing though, like we, we uh, so we have two dogs, Herbie and Henry. Mm -hmm. Herbie's got one wonky eye that just goes off that way, like he Martin does. Feldman. He does. And uh, Henry has human eyes. And <laughs> something about it just, every time I look at him, sometimes he looks back and it just looks like he's really, like he's looking right into my soul. In. And I feel like if you had a very serious guarding the entrance to death dog with four very serious eyes, that would be that would be too intimidating for me to handle. All right, that's fair. That's fair. I just think adorable and I love yeah. that. Yeah. Effective. I mean, good all at their dogs job. are adorable, but <laughs> that, that is dog fair. is also going to intimidate me quite quite righteously. I don't know. There might be a few that aren't adorable on this list. No spoilers. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so it is said that in Nepal and in northwestern India, there is a festival known as Tihar, which on the second day, people place garlands around the necks of dogs and feed them the best foods in order to honor the relationship between humans and dogs. It's very sweet. I like it. So in the first image, I'll go back where you see them with the garlands around their necks and the little, mm. the little marking on their foreheads. That is a celebration of Tihar. It's very beautiful. Very adorable. So next, we're going to move on to El Cadejo. What would we name this pup? Ooh. Mm. Mm. A challenge. I'm feeling going in Eric's direction, like Bertram. Bertram. Bertram, go Bertram. Mm -hmm. I yeah, was going to go book. Greg. Greg, I'm really loving these very human yeah, names, yeah. guys. It's not the way I thought you guys were going to go. Honestly, I thought it was going to be all marshmallows all the way through. But <laughs> here we go. <laughs> So stories of El Cadejo can be found all over Central and South America, uh, most notably uh, in Salvadorian, Belizean, Nicaraguan, Costa Rican, Honduran, Guatemalan, and South Mexican folklore. Uh, so there are actually two types of Cadejo. Uh, there is a white Cadejo that is said to protect travelers during their journey, and a black Cadejo which sets out to kill travelers. In some stories, the black Cadejo is said to be an incarnation of the devil, uh, typically, El Cadejo is described as a large dog-like creature or wolf, like it's often described as being as large as a cow. And uh, these stories tend to indicate that it's something a little bit more twisted than a wolf or a dog. Uh, it's described as having hooves of a deer and much thicker fur than a wolf. And it is said that it runs like a deer more than a dog as it pursues its prey, uh, be that travelers or other Cadejo. Wow, that, that is, seems, yeah, like it would be challenging to identify that at a distance. You know, mm -hmm. like you look up into the horizon, you're like, is that a deer? Is that a dog? Is that a, a whatever, like a, whatever else might be a wolf? Um, and that sort of like animals behaving with the sort of other animals the way you would expect uh, to me is so mythological. Like you look at the thing and it's not exactly what you thought it would be. Yeah. I, I like I'm this just, duality. This. Yes. I like, the, I like the one good dog, the one bad dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to balance them out, you know. Yeah. 
especially when they have uh, spindly little deer legs that are a little bit creepy. Uh, the name comes from the Spanish word for chain, which is cadena, uh, because often the cadejo is said to have seen with a thick glowing metal chain around its neck. Uh, in some stories of El Cadejo, it, they said to ha have more of like a passive figure to it. So it's not actively attempting to kill those who see it, uh, but it is said to be a bad omen or it's said to warn people that the path that they are currently on, like their life path, is going to lead them to hell if they continue on it. Oh. Yeah. Very helpful. Helpful in that way, yes. That's a very useful warning. I it's guess like, it's hey. helpful. It's more, I would still be worried. Like, especially what if you think that you're doing all right and then you see this thing and you're like, oh, oh I've no. got to change everything. But I guess, what I guess all villains probably think they're on the right path. It's a wake up call, man. You know? And yeah, wouldn't you rather know? Don't want to get a, a Christmas carol style only at the very end of your life when you've done irreparable harm. Do you guess, get the I memo guess. that you have to change? You don't want to be Ebenezer Scrooge. That's the mm -hmm. whole point. No. It is said that in the versions where it's the large black dog, it'll have glowing red eyes and it has the smell of sulfur following it, which I love. Ooh. Very brimstone fire kind of style. This love is a that. heck pupper. This is just yes, one is. big heck pupper that is just doing all kinds of troublesome stuff. Yeah. Uh, it is said, though, if you want to ward off the heck pupper, that you can ward it off by standing with your feet together so it can't run between your legs and whisk you off to hell, which I love the image. If you've ever handled like a large dog who is very excited and you are small like me, I, I can get knocked off my feet very easily by a very excited dog. And uh, I, I really relate to that. Uh, and like that. You, you can also use prayer and religious objects to keep it away. Good. Wow. All purpose. Would you guys like to know the origin of the black and white Cadejo in according to El Salvadorian mythology? Yeah, of Heck course. Yeah. So it is said that there were two brothers who stumbled across the home of a man during a storm. Uh, the man asked the boys to help him put some logs on the fire, but the boys did not, they just didn't do a good job. And instead they just ate all of the man's food. As soon so, as this started, I was uh -oh. like, these boys are either going to rob, murder, or fuck up this guy's night somehow. So they ate all the man's food, and when he discovered that they had eaten what little food he had left, and that his fire was starting to no. die, you know, the only thing was his house warm, he put a curse on the road that led back to the boys' village. So when the boys attempted to return home after the storm, uh, they were hunted by these unseen voices, but when they finally turned their backs on them, they were transformed into the white and black Cadejo. Fascinating. Oh. So the idea being like one of them saw the error of their ways and the other one is either trying to tempt you down the path or is like, I messed up in life and let me help you not. Yeah, there you go. It, it really depends on which story you're hearing too, which I really like. Oh. All right, gang, we're gonna move on to our next pupper who is one we're very familiar with here on the show. And it's Cerberus. Cerberus. Look at him. So good. He's, so, he's so intimidating. I love him. In the very first episode of the show, Julie revealed to us that, are you going to go into this fact oh, now? Oh, I'm going to reveal it. Don't worry. Oh, thank goodness. Excellent. So it would not be a tour of mythological dogs without Cerberus. He's the three-headed guardian of Hades in Greek mythology. He's, oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to get your names for Cerberus. Oh, what we would call him? Yes. Mm. What would you call him? I he's mean, probably, probably just Serb. Serb. Like we've I got, think. like we've got Herbert at home, and we Herbie just shorted that to Herb. And mm -hmm. I feel like with Cerberus, that's such like a like a known, well known name. I don't want to change Cerberus's name. I feel you. I feel that. I think I'm going to go on a play off of Cerberus's three heads. Mm -hmm. I've been watching a lot of the Bon Appetit YouTube channel. Of course. And so I think I'm going to go with Mirepoix, the Trinity of onion, celery, carrot, in, in French cookery. Um, and then a it has the letter X in it which is the best. And mm -hmm. as a kid, I was obsessed with having an X in my name and I was so pissed that my parents didn't name me Alexandra, the alternate. Would have been so great. Uh, and B, you could just call them Poi, which makes you sound like you're Poirot. And I'm just really into that. All right, that's very good. That's, I think that's my favorite dog name so far. I, I like Serb as a shortened well, name. I mean, it's very yeah. good. But Mirafoi is just, I want to name a dog that now. I know. So um, Cerberus is described as dragon tail. So in depictions of art, he is signified as having snakes rather than tails, as you can see uh, in the art uh, here on the slide. 
Um, Cerberus is a staple in descriptions of Hades, uh, which is described in the Iliad as being, quote, beneath the secret places of the earth. Ooh, oh, fancy. Beneath the secret place. So there's secret places. This is one level lower. Mm -hmm. Hang on. Does that mean all geocaches lead directly to hell? Potentially, or at least the, the most underworld. secret places, straight down to Hades, it's right down to Hades, right? And you go past all the gems and stuff, and then you're geocaching, and then you're in Hades. There you go. I don't know. Sounds fun. Maybe that's a tempting agent. I don't know. There you go. Um, so he permits the spirits, all of the spirits of the dead to enter once they've been ferried across the river Styx by Charon, uh, but he stops any from returning back to the world of the living. As we've said on the show before, as Amanda began to hint at, but allowed me to make the reveal, uh, Cerberus' name comes from the Proto-Indo-European word meaning spotted. So Hades, God of the Dead, just named his dog Spot. And it's incredible. I love it so it's much. my favorite party fact. So one of the key stories of Cerberus is that he was captured by Heracles as the final of his 12 labors. Uh, Heracles first approached Hades for permission to take his guard dog from the gates of the underworld, and Hades did in fact give him permission, with the caveat that Heracles would use, that Heracles could use no weapon to overcome Cerberus, so he could only use his hands. Which, of course, Heracles manages to do. Uh, he picks the hound up over his head, and then he carries him all the way back to Earth, only for Heracles to return him shortly after, because the king of Mycenae was really intimidated just <laughs> by Cerberus being there. Now, do we think Cerberus just really enjoyed this outing and liked being picked up and carried like a little babe? He just had a good time, probably. Or it's yeah. like, it's like when you're trying to take a dog to the vet and they just keep squirming no matter what, and you're like, please stop. <laughs> It'll be easier for both of us. <laughs> I imagine that's very similar to it. So he brought like. the dog from Hades mm -hmm. to Earth. Mm -hmm. And then he brought him back? Yep. Because the king of Mycenae was like, I didn't think you would actually be able to do that. Uh, can you bring <laughs> him back now? <laughs> like, no, this was too much. I regret <laughs> the request. We got 11 labors. You did them all. I really thought the 12th was when we were going to stop. See, we need his work ethic, and we would have prevented the origin of the previous dog, though. Not that I want to prevent any doggos in the world, but, yes. it's, you know, something to learn from. Well, you know, uh, Heracles was also covered by the guilt of murdering his wife and children, but, you know, not as great. You know. So, fun fact, uh, in my copy of Edith Hamilton's Mythology in the Index, one of the sections on Cerberus is labeled as, quote, mollified by cake. So I had to know what that was about. Uh, so let's talk about it real quick. So uh, in this story, uh, it is the tale of Psyche, uh, who has been tasked with supposedly impossible tasks by Aphrodite in order to get the goddess to help her win back the trust of her husband and Aphrodite's son, Eros. So Psyche is sent to Hades to get a beauty charm from Persephone, the queen of the underworld and Hades' wife. Uh, and though she is super intimidated by the fearsome visage of the three-headed dog Cerberus, uh, she finds that she's able to calm him down with a little piece of cake and passes unharmed. Incredible. Incredible. If, if no one's ever read the index of a book, I just really encourage it. It's very entertaining. It is. Uh, fun fact, Aeneas would also use the same trick to sneak into the underworld to see his lover, the queen Dido later on in Greek mythology. There you go. Oh, I'm also so easily mollified by cake. Yes, everyone, easily mollified by cake. Give me those sweets, hoo hoo. All right, we're gonna move <laughs> on to our next book. Pun who? <gasps> what would you name this pup? That's a good boy. What a perfect friend. <laughs> oh, Is that your name, perfect friend? No, I have to think on this one. Eric, what do you think? I like Doug. Okay. <laughs> Where are you getting these from? <laughs> are these like your your like fourth grade soccer team? Nope, nope. I'm just I I see this. I go Doug. That's what um, I would if I if I was gonna adopt this dog. Doug. Doug. This explains so much about your dogs. They've all had old man names. It's true. I think I'm gonna go with um, sweet potato pie, which would excellent give you. Many options for nicknames, sweet, sweetie, sweetums, sweet cakes, potato, toto, pie, 
pie, <laughs> sweet potato pie. <laughs> you just iterate endlessly. I love it. I love it. I love multiple nicknames. It's great. Uh, so Pan Hu is a dragon-like dog from the Yao people of Eastern Asia, primarily in China and Vietnam, who is said to be their first ancestor. So the story goes that Emperor Ku, who is one oh, of the Oh, I'm five... now seeing the picture on the left. Uh, yes. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't focus it, on that one at first. What was truly happening here. And I, <laughs> I, now I'm like, at first I was like, okay. And then I immediately looked at the picture on the right. I was like, ah, yes, a dog. Nice. And now I'm looking back and I'm seeing what's happening. And I'm not. <laughs> A hundred percent on board. We will have to know why. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the story goes that Emperor Ku, who was one of the five emperors of Chinese mythology and was known as the White Emperor, uh, had a wife who had a long uh, suffering ear disease. So when it was finally cured of it, it was said that a golden worm fell out of her ear. You got to stay with me. This one has a lot of twists. Uh, so she kept the worm because sure, uh, in a gourd, and eventually the worm grew into a dragon-like dog. Mm. Okay, you were right. The a lot the, of twists. <laughs> the mm. dog, uh, which they named Pan Hu, was both adorable and smart as a whip, and the emperor and his wife loved that dog with all of their hearts. It's like when you adopt a shop, and you get a just lovable, lovable dog you weren't expecting, and now they're incredible, and no one could ever take them away from you. Um, so Pan Hu loved them as well, just as much as they loved him. Uh, and when a rebellion attempt happened and a foreign leader escaped after an escaped coup, uh, Emperor Ku Emperor called for the leader's head. Uh, but no one was brave enough to go after the leader, uh, even though the emperor promised that whoever did manage to bring him the man's head would be allowed to marry his daughter, except for Pan Hu. So, Pan Hu sets off on his own. Uh, he waits for the foreign leader to drink too much. And when he's hung over and able to defend himself, unable to defend himself, Pan Hu bites off his head and sends it to the emperor. Oh my. <laughs> this story is like a roundabout. Every time I'm like, okay, I see where it's going. Mm -mm, somewhere else. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a lot of twists and turns. So, um, as promised, the emperor agrees that Pan Hu is allowed to marry his daughter, but not until Pan Hu sleeps in a golden bell for six days, which turns him into a human. Convenient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Based so on the image, I'm worried that- Turns him into a human forever? Forever. Okay. Yes. But based on the image, I'm worried that didn't happen. It, it, that is what happened. It's just okay. so you know who he is. They made him into a dog man for the Oh, arena. okay. I'm much more on board now. Okay, good. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah, I yeah. figured. Yeah. It's if just that's an, an artistic, artistic rendering, yeah, exactly. go for it. So rather than staying in the palace, the newly human Pan Hu did not require such luxuries. And instead, he moved to the countryside with his new wife, where they hunted, they cultivated the land, and then they bore 12 children. Uh, the king, as a gift, gave each of the children, six boys and six girls, by the way, got to make it even, uh, mm -hmm. gave them surnames, uh, which became the most common surnames of the Yao people. So a cool little etymology origin story there for you. Uh, after Pan Hu's death, because he was not an immortal dragon dog, now human man, uh, there were many stories of him blessing his offsprings, but the most well-known one is when a disease struck the Yao villages. In order to survive, all of the villagers with the 12 Yao surnames had to leave their home and travel by boat to a new land. Along the way, the boat was hit by a storm and they prayed to Pan Hu for their safety. Uh, when they arrived sh shortly after the storm on shore, they determined that it was in fact Pan Hu's birthday, and it became a tradition to celebrate their survival and offer up sacrifices to Pan Hu as thanks for keeping his people safe. So this is known as the Pan Wang Festival. It is uh, one of the most important festivals to the Yao people. It is known for its carnival-like atmosphere with singing and dancing, sports competitions, and most famously, the long drum dance, which is now over 2,000 years old as a tradition. Wow. There you go. This guy has quite the life. Started mm -hmm, yeah. as a worm, mm -hmm. became a ear. dragon dog, mm -hmm. became a human. Now he's celebrated for thousands of years. That feeling when the father of your grandchildren started out as an ear infection. Mm -hmm. Who among back? us 
Have Ear infections have ended much worse, much more often. I'm going to let the train go by, but fun fact, Pan Hu, when uh, directly translated, means gourd dog. Mm. Oh man, what a great accidental homophone from guard dog. Um, I, there's the information for it. I forgot to switch over to the slide. So I really wanted on. to keep staring at him. So don't I did worry. like him. There you go. Yeah, uh, now we're going to talk about Fenrir, guys. You give mean me the evil werewolf in Harry Potter? I don't mean that one, but give me your uh, your dog park name for Fenrir. <sighs> He's having a rough time, it looks like. This guy's name is... This one I'm going with more of a traditional dog name. Something like Pork Chop. But like, <laughs> oh, what's a okay. more intimidating version of Pork Chop? Sirloin? T-bone. T-bone. Ooh, T-bone. T-bone is what, I'm think- is what I was thinking of. Yeah. That's really, really good. good. I'm feeling like Lacey or Lucille, you Ooh. know, something right. a little bit flirty, I a little bit Lacey. fresh. Okay. Yeah, I think Lacey. Right. I can see that. Uh, so this is Fenrir or he who dwells in the marshes. And he is perhaps the most famous or infamous of wolves featured in the prose Edda in Norse mythology. Uh, he is said to be the son of Loki and the giantess Agnaboda, uh, and was originally raised by the gods of Asgard themselves in order to prevent him from sowing chaos throughout the nine worlds. Uh, however, Fenrir grew as such at such a fast pace that even the gods were having trouble handling him, and it was decided that they needed to bind Fenrir, chaining him up, basically. Uh, the first few times, first two times, the gods failed, just straight up failed. Uh, but they were able to disguise their attempts by telling the hound that this was simply a game to test his strength. Oh. So uh, the gods then turned to the dwarves in order to forge the strongest chain they could make, uh, though it appeared to be extremely lightweight when it was looked upon, and it was even soft to the touch, which I think is really cool. However, uh, Fenrir was suspicious of the chain because they've tried to lock him up twice now, uh, and refused to let them tie it around his neck unless one of the gods would stick their hand in his mouth as a sign of good faith. Okay, I see it. Okay, I mean, that's, right. that's, I'm with it. That's a lot of faith, because yeah. that dog looked quite mean, and yeah. a hand in a dog mouth, ew, that, could go, that could go a lot of ways. Yeah, well, but if her name was Lacey, he'd be like, oh, sweet girl. But what if what if its name was T-bone? T-bone? Mm. I'd be like, oh, sweet, sweet child, come here. So the god Tyr is the only one brave enough to do so, knowing that Fenrir is absolutely going to bite it off once he realizes he can't free himself from the chain, uh, which is precisely what happens. The gods were able to bind Fenrir and tie his chain to a boulder, uh, but Fenrir did bite Tyr's hand off, and they placed a sword in his mouth so he could not gnaw at the chain. Oh. Well, not, not sad, because uh, it is said, Amanda, that when Ragnarok comes, which is the apocalypse, basically, for uh, Norse mythology, Fenrir will break, the, break free of his bonds and will open his wide jaws, swallowing up anything between the ground and the sky that comes across his path, including, in some translations, the sun and the moon. Fantastic. I think Fenrir Breaker of Chains is my next D&D barbarian. Okay, I like it. I'm into it. Mm -hmm. Uh, He's also said to be destined to kill Odin, uh, but will in turn be killed by one of Odin's sons, Vyadar. That's how it happens. Mm -hmm. Circle of life. Just gotta be sometimes. Just gotta be like that. So much destiny. So So much like This dog is gonna kill you. It's (laughs) gonna get you. But don't worry. One of your sons will eventually get that dog. But not after the dog has swallowed the sun and the moon. It's a real 180 from you have a worm in your ear, but don't worry, he's going to give you many <laughs> grandchildren. It is, it really is. I tried to, I tried to really balance these out. Yep, he did a great job. Well, next we're going to move on to Pulge. What would we name the pup, guys? Oh my name god. Pup. Name that pup. Ah. <gasps> uh. Look at him gnawing on the sun. It's so cute. Yeah. This is a playful boy. He's prancing. He's mm-hmm. jumping all around. Mm-hmm. Mm. He's in the sky. Oh, man. Eric, I'm what do you think? I'm going with Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, Old name Samuel. Samuel. Go on with Sam. Okay. Maybe Sammy. On a good day. 
I think I'll do um, Jack, which sounds regular, but from like Jump and Jack Flash. Ah, okay. Mm. I like it. All right. All right. Like well, a thoroughbred. The, his full name is like Jump and Jack Flash, Breaker of Chains, Son of Fenrir, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. But we call him Jack. Well, his real name is Pulge, uh, and it literally translates to fire dog in Korean, where, as the name suggests, they were dogs made out of fire in Korean mythology. Uh, their most famous story goes that a long, long time ago, there was many heavenly kingdoms, and one such kingdom was known as Kamingnara, or the Dark World. Uh, the king of this realm did not like that the darkness surrounded his kingdom. You know, not great. Um, so he ordered that one of the Pulge uh, had to go and steal the sun and the moon so it may light up their kingdom and keep away the perpetual darkness. Sure. Yeah, wow. sure. So the dog does its duty. It first went and after the sun. However, when he tried to carry it in his mouth, it was too hot and he was unable to hold it for too long. No. So he gave up and he returned back to the king who was furious at the failed attempt. Not great. Uh, this time he sends the fire dog to go after the moon. But much like the sun, the moon is too cold for his mouth and it freezes his tongue and he's unable to hold it for long enough to retrieve it for the king no get a little it's bit tough. of a it's tough a like learn flavor. learning how to play the right way is always a challenge for for a new dog yeah uh he gnaws at it for a while uh, he tries to hold it in between his teeth but eventually once again he has to give up and come back to the king who once again is enraged by the failure no he's trying so hard my son jack <laughs> so the king sends more and more fire dogs, but each one fails. Uh, so it is said that the king continues to send fire dogs to retrieve both the sun and the moon to this day, and that when the sky darkens during an eclipse, it is the fire dogs attempting to bite the celestial bodies and bring them back to their masters. That's very good. It really looks like a bite, Mark. Ah. Uh. It's very cute. Uh, fun funny. fact, there is also a very rare species of dog that is native to South Korea that is named after the Pulgai. It's very similar to a Jindo Spitz breed, but instead of being white or cream, it's a reddish maroon coat, an amber nose, and amber colored eyes, and they are extremely cute. Adorable. Very, very cute. I would name that one Sunbeam. Oh, wonderful. Nice. Any, any My Little Pony name, I think, would apply to this dog very well. <laughs> Thank you. So next we are going to talk about the Arales. Uh, this pup, actually, you guys tell me, what would you name this pup? First off, not a dog. Okay. <laughs> kind of a dog. <laughs> kind of a write dog. Why don't a little bit more dog? Oh, oh man. I don't even know with this one. I think this is like so full happening. human. Yeah, full human full name. Human name? Like Adriadna or something. <laughs> okay. I really, I saw this dog and I thought of Ellen Page. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking more like, I'm thinking more dog name on this one. I'm thinking yeah, like, I'm, uh, like a, a rover or a, uh, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not sure why. Okay. All right. So, I'm so confused by the tail already. Mm. He's also mm -hmm. got wings. Okay. There were a, a lot human of... face, most notably. <laughs> there were not a lot of, um, like period representations of this creature so i had to i had to make do but it does look like a logo for a casino it probably <laughs> is uh so this pup is a dog from armenian traditions uh which they are said to live in the sky or at the peak of mount arat uh it was believed that when a brave warrior was struck down in battle or if someone was like quite literally stabbed in the back uh the Aralas would appear and heal their wounds by licking them I mean, useful, but it would yeah. also deter me from stabbing anyone in the back because I do not particularly want to encounter this dog. Oh no, but they, but they are cute little licking buds. Anyway, so one of the stories goes that the King Ara the Beautiful, uh, which is a great king name, by the way, A+, plus, yeah. uh, he was killed in a battle with the Assyrians, which was only being fought because the Assyrian queen found him so beautiful that she ordered her soldiers to invade Armenia and then bring him back to her so that she could marry him. Oh, 
Wow. Yeah. I mean, I'm a fan of, of women's agency, but I think that might take it a step too far. It's a little bit too much. Yeah. yeah. So when he died in the ensuing battle, she ordered that his body be brought up to her chamber and she called the Arles to her and ordered them to lick his wounds, which healed him and brought him back from death. I wow. am seeing a question here um, from Sydney in the chat. Now, does this pup lick with the human mouth or the dog one? Yep, that I was really also my question. I'm picturing the dog mouth. I cannot confirm or deny whether it is the human mouth or the dog mouth, but mm. it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, it was said that one of the commanders of the Armenian armed forces from the fourth century uh, was laid to rest in a high tower after he died because his relatives believed that he was such a good person and a brave warrior that the Aralas would come and lick his body so he could be brought back to life. Uh, mm -hmm. So I just really like the story. I think that healing flying pups who love to lick is a great story and a great version of dogs. You're right. I'm sorry. I think the illustration just I'm really... Just cover it here. I'll go yeah. to the next page. I'm yeah, sorry they... I ruined it for you guys. No, that's okay. Listen, a good old pup who wants to come and, and lick you and cuddle with you and also heal your wounds. Awesome. Yes, and it's going to be a, a nice comparison uh, to our next one, which is the Raju. Oh. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm not seeing a lot here. of dog in they're, either of these. They're being fought in these. Okay. Oh, oh yes. I now yes. I now see I now okay. see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you name these pups? Mm. Like they look like they're kind of like clouds. So I just want to say cloud, but I feel like that's too too. Well, you're boring, naming him after the uh, the Final Fantasy character. Yeah. And I'm no. I'm see. I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want that to be the assumption either. So I don't want to stick with cloud as my answer. Amanda, do you have anything while I while I maul it over? I do think that's a helpful word association for me. And yeah. I was thinking about something fluffy, something cute to kind mm -hmm. of, you know, um, contrast with the image of the dog. And I think Nimbus is Ooh, very charming. Nimbus is very that good. Is very let's, let's go yeah. with Nimbus. Oh, we have, we have consensus. I have we consensus, have consensus on Nimbus. I love Amazing. it. Amazing. Well, the Raiju's name means thunder beast and is a yokai from Japan that is intertwined with stories of lightning and thunder. So uh, while there are many different depictions of the Raiju and what it looks like, it is commonly portrayed as a wolf, sometimes a blue and white wolf, sometimes it's surrounded by lightning, as we can see in the art here. Uh, sometimes it's made of lightning itself, which is extremely cool imagery in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are said to have long, sharp claws, ferocious faces, and said to have a howl like thunder. Uh, they, much like the Arales, are uh, said to live in the sky. And Raishu are like, they're basically considered relatively harmless, except when storms start up, which drives them into a frenzy. Uh, the way that they travel is they ride bolts of lightning to the earth when thunder claps and cause trouble wherever they land on the earth. Now, that's very cool. We were not very far nice. off with our cloud name, Eric. So I think we were, together, no. we really got there. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people's pets are a little bit afeard when it's stormy outside. So that, oh. that makes me a little sad. Henry is, he shakes. Oh. Henry has recently, those, Henry oh, recently has gotten his own room, essentially. He, uh, <laughs> he, it's wild what's happened. Is that what life is like in the Midwest? You have just extra He's rooms for your pets. So, so, what's, so what's happened is, he doesn't have his own room, just to be clear. He has an appropriate dog size room. He gets very scared during thunderstorms and sometimes during just light rain. It's very confusing. <laughs> and he just shakes very badly. So we put a blanket in the closet and he now, he, so he would try to hide it there, but he never, he always was all over the place. But then sure. most recently, he just always goes in there as soon as we go to bed and he just sleeps in there now. He does not Aww. sleep in the bed anymore. He only sleeps in what we are now referred to as his room, which is just <laughs> the closet. there. Yeah. That's good. Oh, yeah. At least he's not causing lightning related damage in other parts of the country. Oh, don't worry. We'll yeah. talk more about that. Oh. So um, during storms, uh, Raiju are very chaotic creatures. They cause destruction for seemingly no reason. Uh, however, they are also sometimes said to be in the service of the gods. Uh, if someone is said to be struck by lightning, it was said that the gods had sent a Raiju to punish that person. 
Wow. So that's fun. Uh, often in stories in Japanese folklore, Raiju are presented as monsters that are to be slain by great heroes. It is said that in 1153, the hero Minamoto no Yorimasa slayed a Raiju in Kyoto. Another story tells of a samurai named Tachibani Dosetsu, uh, who was taking shelter under a tree when lightning struck. And Tachibani drew his blade at the exact moment that lightning struck, cutting it in two. And when the smoke cleared, a dead Raiju lay at his feet. And from oh. then on, his sword was known as Raikiri, or lightning cutter. Dang, that's also my next weapon in my D&D campaign. Very good. Have Eric Silver make us up that item stat block immediately. Do Check you know uh, if the Spears this, podcast Twitter tomorrow. <laughs> do you know if this is where the name Raichu in Pokemon comes yes, from? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I mean, he's a, he's a mouse, but yes. like this, it's so similar that I was like, it does, it would make sense. Well, Rai means, uh, means, uh, lightning or thunder, I think, ah, in, uh, in that Japanese. That makes sense, then. So yeah. That's, that's where, and then, choo, choo. Uh, the next one we are going to talk about is Sholot. Tell me, thoughts? Ooh. What would you need to Ooh, that is, that's something right there. Mm -hmm. I love this friend, and I'm going to name them. Um, I, I, ooh, what do I need them? I believe in you. So many options. I'm going with Marco. Okay. I was going to go like Bert. Okay. All right. Relatable, All right. friendly, you know. Uh, not quite how I would describe this pup, but. Uh, Is Bert the unfriendly Muppet? Yes. Yes. So it may be suitable. Okay, great. Bert's more curmudgeon than unfriendly, yes, but I would, okay. I would say. Uh, so from the Aztecs, Xolot is said to be the twin of Quetzalcoatl and is the god of lightning and fire and associated with dogs, twins, sickness, and misfortune. Uh, mm -hmm. Often in art, Sholo is shown as having the head of a dog as well as a skeletal form with reverse feet, Amanda, your favorite thing, mm -hmm. and empty eye sockets. I yeah. also don't like reverse feet for the Great. record. Uh, so during the Aztec creation story, the gods created the fifth sun, but realized that it would not move across the sky. So the gods decided that they would have to sacrifice themselves in order to have the sun move. But Sholo did not want to sacrifice himself and instead acted as a trickster, hiding from the gods in the form of first a young maize plant and then a gave plant and then a salamander until the gods finally caught him and he joined the rest of the gods in death. Uh, in another myth, he and Quetzalcoatl travel to the underworld to retrieve the bones of the dead, which humans would later be made out of. That's wow. a wily guy. Yeah, he's a wily I guy. I figured he was going to become a worm by the end of it. No, not a worm. <laughs> Salamander, <laughs> close. Yeah, very close. Uh, the twins, Quetzalcoatl and Sholot, were said to represent the morning and the evening star, with Sholot as the evening star acting as a guide and guardian of the sun as it traveled through the realm of the dead at night. So as such, Sholot is often depicted as being a guide for the newly dead to the underworld. Additionally, there's also a breed of hairless dogs named after Sholot, which are known as the Sholo Litza Quinti, I think, or just Sholo for short. I'm sure those dogs are cute. I'm not they sure are. about their namesake. If you've seen the movie Coco, mm -hmm. the Disney yeah. movie Coco, the dog that accompanies him into the afterlife, that is a Sholo. Oh. Oh, That's yeah. So fun fact about that. Those are really cool dogs. They are. Yeah. They're very cool. Um, we are going to move on to our last pup of the evening, guys. It's been fun, but we're on our last pup. And it is Susith. Okay. All oh, right. a very good hound. Mm -hmm. Very jumpy. Mm -hmm. Got some birds there. There's The birds are not associated with him. I think he scared the birds. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like a good dog park dog should. What are we naming this pup, y'all? I want to go like classical, Artemis, Athena, mm. Hera, mm -hmm. something yeah. along those lines. That okay. that I'm I'm I I don't have a good suggestion, but I I, I like Amanda's as well. It just it, it feels like that's the kind of name. Yeah, I think I would go Charlotte. That's mine. Good a English regal. So from the Scottish Highlands, uh, this is quite similar to the Irish Cushy, which means uh, fairy dog, but absolutely just bigger than your average dog. 
by far. Look at him. Look at him, him oh, yeah. compared to that knight. He's got no chance. That knight um, is boy. not going to have a good day. The Susith was said to be as large as a large calf or a young cow, and it was said to have a dark green shaggy fur. Sometimes it was said that it has such a long furry tail that it was braided in order to keep it from dragging behind, and it had paws the size of a full-grown man's hand. You can see the kind of braided tail in this picture to the right there. So cute. It's very cute. I love a, uh, a blending in with the environment. Mm -hmm. cool. Well, he's a, he's a fae pup, so he's got to be able to do that. Yeah. Uh, oftentimes in stories, it was mentioned that they had fiery, glowing eyes that could cut through the fog of the moors and the highlands. Uh, while there are plenty of stories about large dogs throughout the British Isles, the Seed is inherently tied to the fae because of that beautiful green coloring. Very sweet. Also, I'm sure the last thing you want to see when you're on a misty moor in Scotland, right? Like very early in the morning, it's like a pair of eyes coming at you, but what a sweetie. Yeah, so Susith were uh, respected, but they were also feared. Uh, they were said to take a soul to the afterlife, similar to the modern idea of the Grim Reaper, and thus were seen as a harbinger of death. Uh, sometimes it was said that it would hunt those destined for death across the moors. Leading up to its attack, it will howl three times. But it's said that if you, you can escape that fate if you find shelter before the third howl, which I love. I love that it's like, he's howled Ooh. twice, I gotta find somewhere to go. I like I a love nice that. race. Yeah, gotta get I'm, somewhere. I'm yes. hearing similarities to the Banshee as well, which mm -hmm. I, I appreciate from Irish folklore, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, but if you hear the final howl, you will die from sheer terror you know classic honestly correlation causation we're not sure mm -hmm. here we are that's but, intense you know, that's intense just like the third one is just too scary you're just like that's it i'm done you're like you know what i accept my fate at that point you know i i don't even need to see the dog i just have to hear it howl three times so gang, that is our tour of mythological dogs. I think that there's a lot of very, very good dogs. Some dogs who like, you know, maybe maybe we should uh, bring them to some training or something like, like that. And they need a little bit of a little bit of help so we can understand them a little bit better. But I, I love that there are so many dog stories around the world. It just kind of reminds us and helps us remember how important dogs are to our lives and the stories that we tell. Amazing. Julia, thank you for taking us on that tour. It was my pleasure. Thank you guys for joining me. And thank you all, everyone at home who is listening in, uh, for joining us as well. Yeah. I'm going to exit here and stop our sharing. One second. Uh, stop sharing. So we have right. time for probably a couple quick questions. Uh, oh, yeah. I've, I've, I've kept uh, a look at them. Uh, cool. First one is for me. I think I clicked this answer live. Uh, so uh, how do we pick human names for the dogs? You just got to kind of throw a bunch out there and just eventually you'll you'll just land on something. We uh, When we got Herbie and Henry about a year ago, their names were initially uh, two Patriots players' names. Oh, no. Uh, McCordy <laughs> and Ebner were their names. You live uh, in Ohio. No. And also, yeah, how is I, Ebner a more old man name than the ones that you guys ultimately chose? Yeah, wild. <laughs> Weird how that is. Uh, and so, like, I think it was just some trial and error. We, I think we landed pretty early on, like, two H names for some reason. But, like, I feel like you just kind of, you got to look at them. You got to figure out. I mean, Herbie is definitely the dumb, goofier one, which is, Herbie is kind of more of a playful name. And Henry feels a bit more of a smart intelligent one he's the one with the human eyes so like <laughs> is, we you just kind of gotta like test out a few things over the first week or two sure henry is also seven so is herbie someone asked that uh <laughs> julia someone asked if uh the japanese yokai is also probably related to the legendary pokemon Rai raiku oh yeah 100 percent. it's also a literal thunder dog yeah, so, see, he, that's uh, like a very literal translation of the Raiju. Uh, they took a lot of the um, both Chinese and Japanese and a lot of East Asian influence for almost all of the legendary uh, Pokemon in the first couple of series. Yeah, That's awesome. Uh, I see a good question, Eric, if that's ooh, okay. Yeah, for sure. Um, asking if uh, Julia or I have any pets. I don't, but I have so many plants. Yes, I don't either. Um, mostly because my husband and I both grew up with a lot of pets. Um, and now we are enjoying not having to worry about coming home to a full litter box or uh, needing to walk the dog all the time. 
And similarly, Julia, why do you think that in multiple mythologies, dogs are associated with the underworld? That's really interesting. I think it's because like, Dogs, since we've kind of domesticated them, have always had kind of a service role. So uh, guarding at livestock is one of the like key examples to what we use dogs early on for. Uh, so I think in that sense, like guard dogs have always been a thing. So having them guard the underworld where you don't want people who shouldn't be coming in, coming in or leaving, leaving uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, Amanda, do you have, if you were going to get a dog, a hypoallergenic dog, obviously, as you're mm -hmm. allergic. Uh, what type of dog would you would you go for? I would really want a very big dog. Um, I have oh. a, a friend who uh, has a Visla, which is a beautiful kind of dog. My mom had a Weimaraner growing up. Um, mm -hmm. As a kid, I always wanted a Burmese mountain dog. So I think I'd be drawn to kind of large uh, hound or herder type, uh, type dogs. I, I am of two minds where I would go Newfoundland or mm -hmm. Corgi. One of those two. Tall or short? Totally sure. options. Only, like, only options. No like meat. the spirits hosts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if we were going to have a wild animal mm -hmm. as a mm -hmm. as a pet, what mm -hmm. would it be? I know my answer, so I'll, I'll start since since it's caught you guys off guard. Uh, a koala. I love koalas. <laughs> they are just very chill. It seems like uh, they do have very sharp claws, though, so there'd be that issue. But I've, I, I would always love to. They just seem like they'd be nice to cuddle with. They always be just kind of hanging around if you wanted to just 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 chat with them. If they're the, just there, I feel like they're they're pretty low, low key. I yeah. think you would want a pangolin, which are like those. They're like um, kind of like ant eaters. There, if you if it was a, if a sand shrew was a real animal, it's what a pangolin is. <laughs> okay. And they yeah. just look yeah. sad and yeah. adorable all they're the like time. They're like real tiny, right? They're very tiny. They're yeah. like probably like the size of like, I, I, like that big, I guess, yeah. you know? Yeah. They're very I, um, I know Julia growing up, you had a blue tongued skink. Skink? Okay, I was gonna say scoot, which is closer to a blast <laughs> ended scroot from Harry Potter. Anyway, um, I think I would want a like, Komodo dragon, a baby alligator. This is not responsible and people should not do this in, mm -hmm. in life. Um, but I think reptiles are great and much like me, they need to be warm at all times in order to like have some motion to their, you know, bodies. Mm -hmm. Amanda is cold blooded is what she's saying. <laughs> right on. Do we right think that's on. a good place to wrap up? Yeah, yeah I, I think, think that so, is yeah. good. Amazing. Well, thank you all so much for joining us. Again, if you didn't know us before tonight, thank you for, for having a Taking drink a and hanging out. Us. Yeah, we make a podcast that comes out every single Wednesday. So you can hear us talk about a different story from mythology, folklore, and urban legends all around the world. Some of them are roundups like you heard tonight, um, like mermaids or werewolves in the world um, throughout time. And some of them are individual myths and stories. Um, and sometimes we do urban legends from our uh, listeners, which is always so much fun. Mm -hmm. um, so you can find us at spiritspodcast.com, at spiritspodcast on all the social media, and just search spirits in whatever podcast app you use or Spotify if we are your first podcast. Great. And thank you finally so much to the museum for having us. We absolutely would love to perform in the museum. That's a, a total professional dream of ours. Um, so we look forward to coming back uh, later this year or early next year it would be super fun. Um, so thank you again for having us and I'll hand it right back over to James. Should we sign off first? Let's sign off first. As we finished every single episode, remember everybody. Stay creepy. Stay cool. And now back Bye. to James. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, Amanda and Julia and Eric, Luna and I were captivated the whole time. Uh, we can't wait to have you and welcome you to the museum in the future. Thank you to everyone watching for uh, being here and spending your Wednesday night with us. We hope you will continue to, continue to do so. And uh, I wanna thank our friends from the Lowell Institute for their continued support of the adult programming. Without them, we wouldn't be here tonight. Once again, if you enjoyed yourself, and you can please visit mos.org slash science matters to show your support for the MOS at home initiative. That is mos.org slash science matters from Luna and I, we hope you all stay well. See you soon. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>